won't you come in? You're about to listen to a very nice discussion that I have with a person who is very important to the independent music scene that we all love and relate to. I'm your host, Ray Harkins, and this is a show called 100 Words or Less, the podcast. And I'm trying a different intro for those of you that listen to the show on a regular basis. I'm inviting you into my my digital living room, as it were. Pull up a chair, pour a cup of coffee, whatever beverage you would like. Hang out and you can listen to this discussion. The guest this week, about why am I talking like William Shatner? I don't know. Anyways, Carl Buckner from Earth Crisis, the vocalist. 15-year-old me is absolutely dying. And honestly, 34-year-old me is kind of dying as well. Carl had been a person I've wanted to get on the show for quite some time. I had a professional relationship with him when I worked with him at Century Media Records, when I signed Earth Crisis to the label, and I'd spoken to him a few times. He was extremely nice, but very intentioned individual, and uh, I, I didn't know if he would be interested in doing this and appearing on the show and kind of, you know, opening up his life in ways that he might not have normally done in the past. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get some business stuff out of the way, and then we'll dive into my intro to Carl and everything that he has to say, which is incredibly compelling. Visit the show's website, 100 Words Podcast. Also, there's a newsletter that I am sending out once a week, and I know I I had it going for a while. It kind of died off, but I'm back with a vengeance. So please sign up. You'll see on the right side of the page there's a chance you can... Enter your email in that box, and then you will get a weekly digest of things to listen to, just recommendations and upcoming guests of the show, other cool stuff that kind of, you know, pulls pulls back the curtain of what's happening with the show. Carl, such an important person in my life. Earth Crisis was a huge band and still is a huge band in my life. Their influence looms large over who I am as a person. And I know that that trickles down to many of you who are listening to the show, whether or not Carl and his band were a huge influence They were a major influence on independent music in general um, from the mid-90s until basically now. They still exist. They still are are vital. And they're, you know, they're definitely going down the nostalgia train in many uh, events and some of the shows that they play. But it doesn't mean they're any less vital live because they're incredible. Like I said, Carl is an intense individual, but we had a extremely awesome and pleasant conversation and I was able to pick his brain about things that I had been curious about for honestly 15 20 years and he was very forthcoming there are certain areas that he just didn't go into and that is completely fine because uh, there are some real world implications what it is that he's experienced and gone through so I really appreciated that fact but yeah Carl there's nothing more to be said I'll let him do all the talking and I will talk to you after the episode is done street by street. say this was around uh, let's say 1996 1997 so i'm about 16 17 years old driving to school every day and i I have a a mixtape that i made for myself where basically on one side of the tape i have uh, destroy the machines and then on the other side of the tape uh, on my drive home from school, uh, I have the One King Down Bloodlust Revenge EP. So basically, I drove to school listening to Destroy the Machines, and then I (laughs) drove home from school finishing the record while also having the, uh, you know, One King Down kind of backing it all up. To state the impact that, you know, yourself and your band has had on my life would be, you know, I'd I'd be spending too much time on that. I'm sure for you, it's strange. I I know that myself, I'm not the only person that has obviously been affected by your band, but I'm sure it's strange for you to have perspective on maybe not only your band but like maybe just the destroy the machines record in general to be like this is so weird because you know we were in our early 20s doing this record and like this was you know we meant to make a a statement and an impact but uh we we didn't know that they would have this long lasting ramification so where does it sit all in your head right now it's definitely impressive you know to see how much that specific record has meant to be bullet to put a video together called um, Earth Crisis. I think it's Soundtrack to Revolution or Soundtrack to Action. I'm not sure. And they interviewed um, different people like Daisy from AFI or Andy from Fall Out Boy, Sing of H2O, Peter Young, the Animal Liberation Front activist and, and former prisoner. And it, it was pretty amazing to see like how much those lyrics meant, meant to people. And, and it was in a very real way for some people their their first introduction to environmentalism or animal rights. Absolutely, you know where you're sitting right now. I, I'm sure it's just one of those things where it's like you know 
the record uh, obviously is important to you and you're happy about the band's legacy. I'm sure it's still, I guess, just as weird and humbling to hear these stories of people being like, oh yeah, you're the reason I, I did, you know, whatever, these three things in my life or whatever. Is it, is, is it just weird for you to like have that still sit in your head and be like, oh yeah, I guess that is pretty influential. That was what motivated the record. You know, our, the anger we felt about the injustice that we were seeing done to animals, you know? And I've, you know, mentioned it in almost any interview I've ever done, but I volunteered at the Syracuse Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, and I saw animals that had been doused with gasoline or burned or hit with rocks or pipes just because someone was sadistic for no other reason than that. And it made quite an impression on me. So that, that's where all the anger from Fallout War or Firestorm or Destroy the Machines came from. We literally seeing the animals that have been abused for essentially no reason. And that, that was just one aspect of it. When you think about what's going on with the pharmaceutical companies, they have a section that they're involved with testing on animals or the, the cool psychological experiments that are going on in some universities in the, in the name of psychology, in the name of mental health. I mean, the primate research is it's horrifying. It's like akin to, to think what went on with the you know? No, for sure. I, I, I can easily see where that, obviously all your influences were just poured completely into, you know, every, every single recorded output that you've had. So, but I, I want to back things up and obviously get more, a little more personal where, you know, were you, uh, where were you born and raised? Was it up in the, the upstate New York area or where did you uh, kind of come up, so to speak? Yeah, here, 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 New York. Born and raised in, in the queues. Right. Well, like, if you were to put a pin in the center of the map of New York State, that's where Syracuse is. Uh, when I was younger, we uh, were dealing with a lot of environmental stuff in our area. There was Love Canal, which was a development that was built on top of a toxic waste site in Buffalo. There was a skyscraper a few hours south of us in a city called Binghamton that closed. It was called the Toxic Tower because that was poisoned as well. Um, the lakes to the north, the Adirondacks, um, were devoid of plant life. All the fish were dying because of acid rain. And the city of Syracuse itself is on the shores of Onondaga Lake, which was the most polluted body of water in North America at the time. It had mercury in it and toxic sludge from, I'm assuming it was the, uh, the steel mill. And that lake has been, you know, contaminated since I think the, the 40s. So, I mean, we saw that stuff happening around us. And when I, I was in high school, you know, there was the, the nuclear accident in Chernobyl, and it just seemed like things were really out of control. So that's, mm -hmm. that's where, you know, the, the, uh, the lyrics to like ecocide or inherit the wasteland came from, you know, from right. a, a lot of things yeah. that were literally like at our doorstep kind of how you were as a person, like once you started to kind of, um, you know, grow up and find your own identity, because I mean, honestly, in, in everything that you're speaking about, obviously, not only lyrically, but just what you're sharing with me right now, as far as all the, you know, the, the horrific things that you were seeing at your doorstep, you seem to be like, a, I, I guess, for lack of a better term, like a sensitive person in the sense of you were recognizing these things in an early age. Um, would you define yourself as kind of a sensitive person or, or was it just simply because you were, I guess, paying attention? Yeah, I don't think we, I don't think we would have all gravitated towards, you know, veganism and animal rights or, or human rights freedom struggles unless we did have the ability to empathize with, with other living beings. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I, I guess like once you started to find your own identity and kind of, you know, grow into the person that you, you are, um, did that kind of, uh, you know, start to happen in, in junior high and high school? And like, what kind of kid did you find yourself being? Like, were you, you know, introverted or were you kind of, uh, you know, a social butterfly? You know, where did you place yourself on that spectrum? I'm very lucky because I knew, you know, either sports or music would save me. And I kind of figured that out at an early age. And when I was younger, you know, a lot of my time was devoted to skateboarding or snowboarding or those types of things. And, you know, we were kind of like a pack of wild animals out for a good time every day. <laughs> right. So I don't think we were, I don't think we were introverts, but at the same time, you know, we interacted with kids from the, the quote unquote other cliques. Absolutely. So what, what kind of clique did you, you find yourself being a part of? Was it kind of like the, like you said, the, the sort of skater kids, um, was that kind of your, the crew that you ran around with? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, punk rock to us was kind of like what, like, like South Park or Family Guy is, is now, you know, I mean, it was, it was outrageous and obnoxious and, and entertaining. And it was like a great 
soundtrack to come out of the boombox on the deck of the half pipe. You know what I mean? So right, right. it didn't mean that much beyond that at the time until I started to get a little older. And so this is always kind of uh, kicked around in my head in regards to you specifically. Um, is is technically like Earth Crisis your your first band? Like, or did you did you try sort of other musical projects? You know, whether or not you actually you know put out a demo or played shows or anything like that was uh, was Earth Crisis kind of your first real experience as far as being in a band? You know, I played music with different people and had mm-hmm. the idea, but Earth Crisis was the first band I ever like performed or recorded with absolutely you know it was the first actually kind of work right right yeah yeah obviously yeah here we are speaking about it some 20 odd years later so (laughs) and so so as you started to kind of you know uh go through high school and start to you know figure out your likes and interests like did you uh did you have a vision as far as like you know did you care about school were there things that you um uh, i guess applied yourself towards as far as like particular subjects or did you have an eye for sort of a career that you wanted to you know pursue yeah i mean i think like i said i felt like i would wind up doing something with with a sport or with music. I, I was realistic enough mm-hmm. to know that it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be everything. So my, my goal when I was younger was to go on to college and, and hopefully be a history teacher. So I did. Oh, okay. I was very focused in, in school. You know, I, I definitely tried to get good grades and, you know, I never really got in trouble or anything. Yeah. You kind of live by the letter of your, of, of your parents' law, so to speak, as far as like you were, uh, I guess, an obedient kid. My parents weren't really, they weren't really around. I mean, they were pursuing their own stuff. So I was kind of free to roam. You were uh, figuring out your own parenting, as it were? I guess so. Kind of like, <laughs> kind of like Lord of the Flat when I think back on it. Right. Well, yeah, there definitely is um, that element of you're a kid and you seem of the age where you're self-sufficient and, you know, your, your parents are just like, all right, well, he, I, I, he can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I have often said that, I, you know, when we're out on turn in the van, it's like, did, did, did your dad or mom ever give you any advice or talk to you about this or that? And like, no one's parents really did. It was a little odd. Right. <laughs> See, you didn't have to sit down and talk with your uh, parents about the birds and the bees. <laughs> oh, none of that stuff. <laughs> I, I, for lack of a better term, like, w- w- would you would you define kind of your introduction to, I guess, punk and independent music in general? Was that ushered in uh, via skateboarding? Absolutely, yeah. yeah I remember we got like uh, the Bones Brigade movies, and then Terra Tahoe and Rage at the Badlands, and we we're like, wow, what's this? Oh, that's Agent Orange. Oh, well, this is the faction, and then we started finding. Was that kind of ushered in by a particular person? You know, like, because who who is kind of? Uh, I, I always like to refer to these people as kind of the gatekeepers. You know, you always have your whether it's like an older. Brother or sister, or whether you have like the dude at the record store, or just a friend that seems te- you know tapped into it. Um, did you have that sort of you know uh, I guess guide? We did. It was my cousin Stefan. Yeah, yeah. He played bass, and he uh, he played bass in a band called Crucifixion of Christ. Okay, and a couple of years older than us. He's a very tough dude. He uh, went into the military and had a career and fought in a couple wars later on. But, you know, he was already kind of a ferocious guy and we were kind of following his lead. So we thought, you know, whatever he was doing was was normal at the time. <laughs> so you looked up to him and were like, all right, that guy seems to have it figured out. Like, we'll do that. You know, I remember he got us into uh, Angry Samoans and Black Flag and all that kind of stuff, Motorhead. And so then uh, did you did you actually attend college after high school? Yeah, I went for two years. And then we got the offer from Victory, which was like a, a legitimate multiple record contract. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I could, you know, keep going with school later on. I might as well, we might as well give this a try while right. we all there. And, and that's pretty much what happened. And I think we're probably on Victory for like 10 or 11 years. Earth Crisis technically started when you were in high school or was it, was it like after you had graduated? I think it was um, my senior year. I'm sure the music that you were bringing home and, uh, you know, kind of whatever, being exposed to was completely the antithesis of what your parents had obviously listened to. So wh- how are they reacting um, to you all of a sudden getting into this, uh, you know, really uh, aggressive stuff and then obviously eventually like, you know, playing in the band and like what were they just like, oh, Carl, like what's what, what do you got going on here? You know what? I'm smart. I never really subjected them to it. I would always listen to it either in the headphones in the stereo or in the car because I've always wanted to listen to like hardcore metal or pop loud. Kind of fortunate in that way, you know, so they, 
there was never really any arguments about it. Right. So you you, ke- you kind of kept it shielded in in a, in a way. In a way, yeah. Not. I mean, I was wearing you know agnostic front shirts, acromatic shirts, or whatever. I mean, I don't really remember getting much pushback for it. I remember I had a Mickey Alba shirt or a Salva shirt, and it had a a topless witch coming out of a dreadlock or, uh-huh. or dreadlock out of a, what are those things called? A cauldron disappeared because I think maybe my mom was freaked out by it, but everything else seemed to make it, you know, from my room to the washing machine back, somehow back to my room without <laughs> right, right. Right. right, other than one salvage shirt. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, that, that apparently didn't pass muster. <laughs> <laughs> so then so then obviously i mean it's you know I, i'm not going to get an in intimate detail in regards to earth crisis's career just because that as we were talking about before i started to record it's been very well documented but so I, i'm going to try to you know uh, evoke some feelings and kind of just you know having you describe certain times within the band's career where obviously it's like as uh you know as you guys started to rise to prominence in regards to you know just getting out there on a more nationally uh, recognized tour and you know more people paid attention to what you were doing was it one of those things that you guys were i guess surprised at people kind of paying attention to you because i mean to put it in context i mean mostly for the listener not for you because you lived it but like obviously in the early 90s like the concept of being a touring hardcore band was still uh very rare and not really commonplace so um I'm sure in some respects you guys felt like you were uh, we- weird trailblazers in a sense. Did, you know, it's weird. Like I had spent so much time traveling with my friends skating. You know, like we would go to contests in Rochester or Albany or Binghamton. And then when I got a little older, you know, we went to California or we went to Florida. So I was already kind of used to that, you know, being together with friends and traveling. And it, it felt very natural. It didn't, it didn't seem it didn't seem any different. But what was was interesting was when we were getting things going here, everyone in the audience was essentially a friend or someone that we knew or someone's brother or, you know what I mean? And then we'd go to another city and the kids were staying along and we'd never seen them. And I remember that kind of striking us as, as odd. Right. You're like, hey, that's not my friend singing along. Yeah, this is a guy we've never met. It's unusual. <laughs> sure, sure. Um and you, this is me kind of projecting on you, but for whatever reason, in, in my years in the music industry, I always noticed that it, it tends to be the singer that kind of gets put upon as far as like the business of the band is concerned. In, in working with you guys professionally, it was obviously like Scott, who I was doing most of the communication with, your guitarist. Um, did you ever have that, um, I guess, you know, sense of, of business about you? Or is it one of those things where you were just like, dude, I could care less about like the business of the band, as long as I'm included in like these aspects of it, or you know, where where was your head at as far as that stuff was concerned? We always discuss things together as a band. You know, I guess you could kind of say Scott is the tribal leader, right? So, so he's kind of like the the spokesperson or the, the liaison, or the liaison with you know whoever we're doing the interview with. Absolutely, yeah. Like I said, it does. It usually seems to have like one kind of person in the band that sort of you know tackles the i guess the proactivity of it like booking shows and all that sort of stuff so like did you uh did you ever have an interest in that or was that simply just like yeah not on your radar because you weren't concerned about that you were concerned about other aspects of the band i think everyone contributes equally you know because we'll have the discussions and we'll kind of work out a map as to what we want to accomplish we're getting ready to put a record out or you know where we want to try and tour or, or how much touring we want to try and do and then he essentially, you know, works out the logistical details of things. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a skilled businessman and he, he is really a great communicator. So I don't I don't even think it's that hard for him. I just feel like it, it just kind of comes naturally to him. Yeah, that makes sense. I, 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 I like the way that you present that where it's just like, yeah, you guys all work on the sort of blueprint and then, yeah, then one person is meant to obviously execute and do the logistics. So that's cool. Yeah. And so then, uh, as more attention was was paid to you, on, like I said, on a more national touring level, and you guys started to, you know, uh, play out and like, you know, get to California for the first time, and obviously, like the California takeover show at the Roxy is, you know, kind of infamous not only just because it was a good show, but because it was actually officially released. What are some of those, like, I guess, surreal moments that you have in your head of where you, you know, like you mentioned, where a stranger was singing along to your songs? Like, what other moments, kind of, in those earlier days, stick out to you as being like? what the hell is this? Like, this is crazy. You know, like I wasn't expecting this. 
you know, for anyone who's older, they'll they'll remember that like straight edge essentially was like the smallest segment of hardcore in the late eighties or the nineties. Like it was it was definitely dying down. You know, to so to see it come back to life and then double and triple and quadruple the amount of people that were, you know, going to shows or playing in bands. I mean, it was we felt like it was a like genuine victory. It was kind of apparent like when like MTV came and did like the uh the special called Smashed about alcoholism. Right. And, and they included us and our music in it or when CNN and the Network Earth show came and interviewed us and and show us playing live and had our music in it. I mean, that was pretty amazing because that was that wasn't just played like in America. That was played all over the world. Because uh, at that time, you guys were kind of in your your mid twenties, right? So I, I guess it wouldn't be uh, like you were obviously. I wouldn't say uh, ready for the spotlight, but you guys were a little more prepared to be able to. I, I guess get your get the point across of what obviously not only your ethics were, but just kind of the the, the message behind everything. Yeah, exactly. Like we didn't, we didn't feel like we were kids, you know. We felt like we felt like we could handle the stress of a tour, and and then go out and do another one and another. And then, as that stuff was was swirling, did you um did you guys? Because obviously, at that point too, like you know, even hardcore bands, like they didn't, you, you didn't have any idea that this was going to, you know, really like quote unquote turn into a living. So was it one of those things that like once you guys would get home from tour, you would all kind of. Uh, respectively go back to, you know, whatever bagel shop or <laughs> a part-time job just to kind of get you through? Or how were you guys operating at that time? Yeah, we always worked, always. You know, Scott and, and Ian um, are both audio engineers, you know, so they would work on that and, um, you know, working at the bank or working at a uh, friend's store, whatever it took to kind of fill in the gaps. Yeah, we would always come home and work. What did you do specific? What did you do specifically when you returned home? I did uh, renovations and carpentry with my friend Sal and my friend Bob. So you, you are a man that can can build stuff, I guess. I can build stuff. <laughs> Not as well as them. Not as well as them. Emblematic of kind of a because I, I would define Syracuse as a very working class town, um, and so that's very emblematic of the fact that you would be like, all right, well, yeah, here's here's carpentry. Like I, I know how to do this with my hands, and I can build build things. Like that's I can see the correlation between the two. All right, all right. You know, we put up fences or um, we build porches or whatever needs to be done. Right. I know a lot is made. Uh, especially like all, all those those news programs and specials that you guys did. And I always remember uh, as a, you know, obviously an outsider myself to be looking at what you guys were able to accomplish and the, the message that it got across. It was always a sense of pride where I was just like, I was so happy to see who I was at the time and still am like, you know, straight edge to be like represented on such a national level. Um it, was it one of those things where you guys, uh, you know, I guess for lack of a better term, you felt pressure because obviously you were being focused on so much to be the voice of this thing. Um, and obviously, like, even though you put it out there that you were ready for that responsibility, uh, did you guys feel, you know, any pressure, uh, maybe just specifically yourself of being like, OK, well, I better, <laughs> I guess, for lack of a better term, deliver? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, what the best way to describe that would be other um, than. You know, to just say that, like, you know, we really did feel let down by, like, a lot of the, the strange bands we grew up loving. You know, we were traveling to see them. We were buying their their albums the day they came out and literally, like, like loving their music. And, and it was nurturing what I felt was, like, an important part of us. Like, things that we believed society was definitely, you know, in contrast with were being celebrated, like the whole concept of being drugged and alcohol free and taking pride in it. Um, so we did. We felt let down when a lot of those bands, you know, stopped being straight edge. And when we got to the point where we, you know, were able to start Earth Crisis and get it going, you know, we were like, we have to do this. We have to do this right, you know, so that our fans will never feel let down. Like straight edge is forever. You know what I mean? And we have to do this band forever. This is important. I can understand where you guys are coming from, but that's a like pretty big burden to bear in regards to the fact that like, I mean, even though you were in your early twenties and obviously not just, you know, a dumb 16 year old playing in a band to have this sort of, um, agenda hoisted on your own backs. And I think that's what makes you guys such a one of a kind band. Cause there's very rare bands who could be like, all right, dude, we're going to go ahead and carry all this shit on our back. Like literally from the first day. Um, 
but I, but obviously that's who I guess who you guys were as, as people to, uh, you know, be able to take that agenda forward. Right. I mean, to, to us, it's like, you know, the whole thing was sacred and it still is. And, and that's how we wanted to, to project it and promote it. It's, it's like, this is sacred. This is, this is forever. Yeah. It's obviously respectable. <laughs> um, I think something that I've actually joked around with with Scott about when I was working with you guys professionally um, and something that I've noticed and I think is is very um, uh, telling of uh, who you guys are as people when uh, the DVD that uh, came out of, you know, showing you guys on tour in Japan and kind of, you know, showing a retrospective of the band in a way, um, because most people at that point, you know, the Internet was still in its infancy and people People just looked at Earth Crisis and you guys as individuals as being like this humorless, just stoic individuals with no real personality besides just the agenda you're trying to push across. But the DVD obviously showed a different side of things. Was that extremely important to like you personally to be like, okay, like we're more than just, I guess, what you kind of think us to be? You know, that was uh, our buddy Doug was out with us and he was filming the shows and he started filming just our you know, day-to-day nonsense. And I didn't really expect any of that kind of stuff in the DVD, you know, because when when we did the CNN piece or ABC News or the MTV thing or the Recovery Network or any any of the any of the times that the these networks came to film Earth Crisis, it was just, you know, kind of us talking about being straight edge or showing us playing live. You know, so I figured it would be kind of just like a, a long-form version of that. You know, but he just started filming us like, <laughs> like hoisting, you know, watermelons <laughs> off the roof of a hotel or just us fooling around, you know, which is basically what happens over the, the course of the day. And it did. It kind of showed like the fun side of like what goes on, you know, for the majority of the time we're out on the road. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think it was, for lack of a better term, it was a very humanizing thing to do. It, it's just, it's real easy to put you guys as individuals in a corner, like I said, of just this this overly serious, um, you you don't even know how to laugh, <laughs> and then and but that's has, the thing that's in in a way that's almost a success because all of us grew up, you know, with punk rock and the skateboarding. So I mean, we do we have you know kind of a massive sense of humor. But when it comes time to write, when it comes time to perform, when it comes time to do an interview then it's time to take things serious. The reality is that's only like one hour out of a day on tour or or an hour or two. (laughs) So I did, I did think, I do think kids were surprised when they saw us just you know, fooling around and, and being right, right. <laughs> Something I find so interesting too that I, you know I wanted to put in context where it's like I think it was so um, obviously pre pre internet and your guys' band existed mostly in the pre internet era um, and obviously uh, especially in the context of the uh, punk and hardcore scene rumors were always such a, a a funny thing where it's like you know oh this band is coming through on tour and like there's going to be a crazy fight or whatever you know it just happened it was commonplace because obviously there wasn't um video phones and everything else that that made it easy to document and debunk these rumors uh what what are some of the favorite rumors that you like you remember in your own head either about you specifically or about the band that was just you know brought you guys great humor because of its you know sheer uh ridiculousness i don't know scott would probably be a better guy to ask i've always kind of like tuned that stuff out to be honest with you uh-huh. I, you know um, oh yeah no, nothing's coming to the forefront of my thought i think that's probably kind of maybe indicative of more more of who you are as a person where it's like you know you you strike me like are would you define yourself as a as a focused person or is that is is would that be an appropriate representation of you yeah absolutely i mean i don't think i'd be able to you know, do three bands at a time if I wasn't, you know, at least focused on music. <laughs> right, right. So I, I guess the, the, the focus allows you to, I guess, ignore some of the white noise that surrounds you um, because it would be it would be easy to get bogged down in some of the, you know, stupid rumors when, you know, it's right in front of your face. But you're just like, nah, it's, that's not important. Yeah, it, it really isn't. I just kind of, I just kind of like, uh, you know, sidestep all that stuff. I, I guess, you know, kind of on that same point, like, I'm sure because once people, you know, come to a show and interact with, you know, you as a person and, you know, realize like, obviously, like you're a human and, you know, you joke around and you obviously have a personality. 
what are some of the, uh, I guess, misconceptions that people have of you prior to like meeting you that they express, you know, or just like, oh, I didn't expect you to be this way or whatever. Um, is there anything that sticks out in your mind that people have uh, kind of projected on you that you've been able to uh, <laughs> steer them away from? Yeah, every once in a while, somebody will say, oh, Earth Crisis, oh, they're a tough guy band or oh, they're jocks or whatever. I mean, that, that stuff has always gone on, you know, those kinds of things have always been twirled at us. And like I said earlier, you know, I just kind of like tune it out and sidestep it. I mean, I, I don't feel like there's any need to like, you know, make some big display of no, we're not, no, we're, we don't do that. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's unimportant. You know, I think that like kids that actually follow the band and value it, they're, they're going to figure it out. Mm, they're they're, right. they're yeah. going to know. I, I find it interesting too, because like, you know, kind of on the fact that, you know, you define yourself as a, as a focused person. Um, there's obviously this marriage between, you know, art and, and, the idea of expression that you guys obviously are using a band as, as a vehicle, as you've illustrated before, like, you know, a weapon to counteract all of the, you know, wrongs that you see in the world. The idea that, uh, you know, there's, there's some, you know, sort of careerist aspect to it where it's like, you, you guys have been able to do it for a, a very long period of time. In your own head, was there, was there ever any points where you felt like there were um, threats to the fact that, you would have to, uh, you know, I guess for lack of a better term, you know, compromise certain aspects of, of the band, not so much for the message, but just like the way that the band functioned because of, uh, you know, whatever financial constraints or anything else. Oh, I mean, we're never going to do the Jägermeister tour. I mean, I can tell you that straight out. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you, you mean the, uh, the, the, the Ozfest where you get there was the huge alcohol banner behind you guys? You know, one important aspect of all of this is, you know, if somebody's vegan and they're taken seriously and they're trying, and at the same time they're trying to forward a message that is in you know direct contrast to what society says is cool and what you should be involved with, you're going to run into those types of things. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. You know what I mean? And of course, it'll be, you know, it'll to an extent look ridiculous, but at the same time, it's like it's better to get out and it's better to try and knock down those walls and get the message heard. Yeah, no, I I, I see what you're saying. Um, <laughs> yeah, cause it, it's hard because, you know, it's like, I, I, you look at certain bands that obviously, you know, tow a very ethical line and then there's like certain levels, like just a random example where it's like, you know, uh, a, a, a hardcore, that hardcore band tragedy. That's like, you know, members of his heroes gone. And I'm sure you're at least tangentially familiar with them where it's like, you know, they have a very specific, uh, you know, agenda to their band as far as like, you know, very anti-capitalist and, you know, functioning, you know, below the radar, um, but then it's like you, there's an argument of like, well, who are you actually going to expose yourself to when you're content playing, you know, to 800 people in a warehouse, you know, I'm sure, uh, there were elements of, of those discussions that you guys had where it's just like, okay, well, yeah, this isn't our ideal situation, but I guess this is going to expose our message message to a wider level. Right. And you know, the reality is like I, like I mentioned, it's, if you're going to stand up on a stage to perform, there's a pretty high chance that there may be a Bud Light sign in the window behind you. You know what I mean? Or there may be a banner that says, you know, Drink Miller or whatever. I mean, you can't control every aspect of everything that goes on. Uh, it's better just to get out and, and do it and perform the songs and get the records out, you know? Yeah, at absolutely. The time, at the same time, we're not going to sign out of the Yeager Moisture Tour. There's a line that is drawn. And so then when... Uh... Obviously, as the band you know continued to progress musically, and then obviously working with different record labels, like you know once you guys left Victory and you know went to Roadrunner, and then obviously back to Victory. Um, I know obviously a lot of people point out the Slither record as being uh, the most quote unquote unlike Earth Crisis that they've ever heard. Even though I I, I would personally disagree because there's obviously a lot of what you guys are in that record. But at the time when you guys were kind of in that headspace, um, was it one of those things that you're like? Like, okay, musically, we have to try something differently. We can't just be this this band that we have been for the past couple of years. Like, where was, your, where was your head at as far as entering that, that record cycle and that space? You know, working with the slower tempos and some of the stuff uh, that we did on Firestorm was very different from the seven inch that preceded it. I don't think that Destroyed Machine sounds like a more season ends. I think they were all individual experiments in, in what we could do as far as creating aggressive hardcore. And I think that when we got to Slither, you know, we kind of revisited some of the original ideas, like from All Out War, where there was a mixture of vocal approaches. And if you go back and look 
at the lyric sheet just for there, and the title track itself, it's a pro Second Amendment song. And that is right. not something that is very popular in our world. You know, in the right. part of course, you know, people don't want to hear that, you know, well, we as a band collectively feel that law abiding citizens should have the right to own a fire. You know, that right there is going to get us knocked out of a lot of punk magazines or a lot of hardcore magazines because people have an opposing viewpoint. How could these vegans espouse this view? This doesn't make sense, you know, because that's, you know, how people view things. And when they immediately hear about weaponry, they immediately think, you know, of rednecks or of hunting or what have you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I feel like that to this day, you know, whether people like the music or not, it was the most daring record we ever did lyrically because of the subject matter uh, of, of the lyrics. So mm -hmm. here we are in Strange Band with a pro Second Amendment song. Yeah, I do. I think people should be able to own firearms if they're law abiding and they can pass a background test. I think it's important. Nope. Self defense. But, you know, for us, I feel like it was the most daring, one of the most daring things we ever tackled being in the scene that we're a part of. Right. Um, so, like I said, self defense is a human right. If people can pass a background uh, check, and they haven't been involved in any violent crimes or they haven't victimized anyone, I think they absolutely should be able to own a weapon. You know, and uh, the lyrics to... Uh, uh, there's a song about uh, called Killing Brain Cells. Oh, yeah. I remember one of the activists at the time was, well, Earthers are trying to go mainstream. So if we were trying to go mainstream, would we have an anti-alcohol song called Killing Brain Cells and another <laughs> song that was pro-Second Amendment on the same record? I mean, that, that doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? So I thought yeah. that was the third thing for people to turn horror at it. Whether they, right, right. Whether they like the music or not. I mean, you know, as always, there was a, an animal rights song and a lot of the, you know, more common, common to our band issues that we kind of forward to the music. That, that was all right. there. Well. And so then as, as you guys uh, started to, you know, wind down, like, or you basically, you started to tour less and obviously be less active from, from that perspective, just because it was, uh, you know, difficult to obviously make ends meet from a financial perspective. Was it, w w was it one of those things where did you personally have kind of, uh, you know, any sort of uh, struggle sort of, um, for lack of a better term, like uh, ramping that down? Because obviously I know you did, obviously, you know, you did Freya and you've been musically active ever since um and obviously including earth crisis as well but was there ever any a time when you were kind of like well everybody knows me as carl earth crisis like you know is is like you know <laughs> who am i or it, was there any sort of like existential crisis that you had in your own head kind of you know ramping down the touring and stuff like that you no know, i mean i obviously missed you know dennis and scott when they got married and and moved away which is basically what happened you know and keeping in mind this was before we figured out that we didn't all have to live in the same city in order to do a band. Um, so we felt that that was the best decision to make. You know, they were heading out to California and with their new wives and we're going to be involved in other things. So my plan was, well, we'll do half of resistance when we can. We'll revive that project. And Scott and Dennis were working on a band called Isolated, and that's when we started Freya. And I don't think Freya would exist without the Slipper record. You know, I, we kind of were trying to see what we could do melodically with vocals with like clean singing. And it was, I felt like it was starting to work well enough that we could introduce more of it into another band. And, and that's pretty much what happened. It, it just didn't, it didn't really have anything to do more than with, you know, us not knowing how to do the band, not living in the same city. You know, we've been so used to, used to that for over 10 years and we didn't see how we could make it work if people were living on the other side of the country. So and so you, 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 you felt like you could, you could pour all your creative energy into uh, obviously a, a new project. Like you, you immediately knew that you wanted to do other things uh, because of, of the, the, the logistical distance that prevented earth crisis from playing. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, everyone's friendship was strong. Everyone loved the music. Like I said, I mean, if you compare like, the more season ends to Firestorm, it sounds like a completely different band, you know, because I think they're so, they're so, uh, they're so different from each other. You know, it's not like sure. the, the standard, like, you know, verse, chorus, verse, guitar break, mosh part, what have you, you know what I mean? <laughs> so for yeah. us, we didn't feel like Slither was that outrageous. We felt like it was like another 
from our perspective, progression. Because I, I know, obviously, since you mentioned earlier that there there was an interest in some capacity to, um, you know, be be a history teacher, be a teacher in some respects, because there, you know, I, I'm sure you've had a decent amount of friends who have been involved in, in punk or hardcore that do end up being teachers because there are some parallels uh, there. Did you uh, did you ever have, have any other uh, interest, you know, later in life to be like, huh, that could be interesting. Like I could, you know, potentially, you know, be in academia as it were, because obviously you are a, you know, well-read uh, individual. So was there ever anything kicking around in your head to maybe, you know, fi- fire that idea up again? I still think as a history teacher would be a cool idea. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, I think no matter what was going on, I would, I would feel torn. I would want to do music full time. So like, the smartest thing to do is just do the music. Granted, when Earth Crisis is not, if not active, you know, Freya is, or Vahimus Serenade is, or Path of Resistance will pop up. I mean, we're we're always working on something, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're not you're not you're not stagnant from that perspective as far as the creative output is concerned. I mean, I think, um, I think we've probably over the last like 25 years, you know, counting counting seven inches of live stuff. I mean, we've probably put out like 23 or 24 records at this point between all the different bands. Yeah, that's that's not being lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so b- because you've obviously kind of set your set your life up to reflect the fact that, you know, you can tour whenever you need to with any one of your your, your projects and stuff like that. Um has there has there ever been any, the the notion of like, you know, cuz obviously people grow up, they get married, have kids, do that do that whole thing. Um that that has never seemed personally, and this is me just projecting. Has that ever been part of your, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, agenda? Something that you desire yourself uh, at some point in your life? I, I like I said, you know, I think the smartest thing for me to do is is what I'm best at, and is to to focus on the music. And, and I'm de- I definitely am driven towards it. Like like we discussed earlier, I feel like it is like the focal point. It seems like basically you kind of strip everything away to be able to. Uh, I just pour yourself into, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, like trying to, you know, make make the world around you as cliched as it sounds, you know, a, a better place. When kids come up and tell me that, you know, the band has has literally meant something special to them, and they would have never heard of even if they were strange without us, or we were their introduction, and you know, now they, you know, they love Earth Christ, or they love propaganda, or they love conflict, or whoever else. I mean, I do, I do feel like that is a huge success. I really do, because. It doesn't. It doesn't seem outrageous for me for humans to be living in in harmony with nature or with each other. It doesn't. It's, it's like a like a realistic goal, but it's you can't measure it in you know in months or years. You could measure it in decades and steps towards that that end result. I think it's a. It takes a. It takes a very uh, special person to obviously just you know pour themselves into one particular thing when obviously there are many barriers and conventions that would dissuade you to do that. Otherwise, you know, it's like there's there's every reason for you to, you know, uh, uh, for how long you've been involved, there's every reason for you to not care. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, just like just by by default, you know, it's like people when you get up on stage with Earth Crisis or one of your other projects now, you're sometimes playing to kids who are, you know, 30 years younger than you. Um, is, that, is it one of those things where it's like, is that energizing to you or is it like just kind of mind blowing that that happens? It's definitely mind blowing. But then I think about it, you know, it's like, like, Keith, how old is Keith Morris now? I mean, he's got to be. Like close to sixty or Waddy or you know Circle Jerks exploited. I mean, some of these bands. I mean, some of those guys have to be like close to sixty. And I think yeah. they're doing great stuff. You know, so I mean, I do see an example that that you can keep going and and create like quality work and and still be who you are and still forward a message that that matters and and hopefully will be received by people. Precedent has been set. Like you know, clearly they're like you mentioned. You know. Keith Morris and Henry Rollins and all these other people who it's like they they dedicate themselves to you know the work whatever that work may be there's a a roadmap that you can look at where it's like okay like I'm I'm heartened by those people still being around because you know I still care so I see the Chromax play or Agnostic Sun or you know Exploited and I think these guys are just as good as they've always been if not better and they, and some of those guys have like you know maybe 10, 15, 20 years on me. So <laughs> all, all, all arrows point towards keep going. So l- last thing I want to hit on before I let you go is the, it just the, you know, I mean, basically how you, um, you know, how you occupy your time, obviously when you're not, um, you know, uh, 
learning and obviously growing from a, a musical perspective. So, you know, like what are you doing, uh, you know, what are you doing for work as you're off the road kind of now and like what sort of uh, other things outside the musical projects that you do kind of keep you engaged and excited? You know, for work is, you know, it's the same stuff as ever. Um, you know, guys are engineering or they're working at the bank or I'm doing the renovations or whatever need be done um, with some of my buddies. And, uh, you know, trying to learn how to play other instruments. And what are you, what are you, what are you trying to, uh, learn yourself? Are you trying to like, cause did you, did you ever mess around with other instruments throughout your life as far as guitar and, and drums and stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, I, I started with piano and then went to bass guitar and guitar, but I, you know, I just try to kind of upgrade my skill level with all that. And I try to still skate and, and snowboard when I can. So. I mean, for pretty much the same things interest me, you know? I, like I said, I was really lucky to be able to discover the things that I have a genuine love for at an early age. It's just stayed, it's, uh, it's stayed the path where it's like you, you, is, you essentially are just a, uh, I guess, ho- hopefully more intelligent and more uh, established person in your life than when you were when you were 14 or 15 years old. Still the same stuff. Hopefully. Right. <laughs> and it's and it's funny because a lot of people would probably look at that and be like, oh, like you haven't even grown as a person. But, you know, <laughs> there I'm sure that there's elements where you're just like, well, no, I just I just figured it out earlier than you. <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to golf with you, bro. So stop it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's exa- I, I, I can't think of a more appropriate place to end that conversation. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really, I, I really appreciate you hanging out with me, Carl. This has been, uh, it's been fun for me. I hope it's been uh, engaging for you in some level. All right, thank you, Ray. So that's Carl. Holy moly! I really can't believe that I was able to have that sort of open and frank discussion with him, and uh, it, it was just, it was, it was great. And I had a few conversations with him afterwards because he was concerned about the way certain things came off and what have you. But uh, yeah, I was really glad that it came out like it did, and you were able to listen to it. So. I really appreciate Carl for going out on a limb, trusting me, and being able to escort him through uh, territory that he typically doesn't talk about. So anyways, the producer and editor of the show is Tom Richfield, my bro forever. And visit the show's website, 100wordspodcast.com. Email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. And we have a special month's worth of shows coming up. It's all theme for those of you that listen to the show regularly. Get excited. You like those themes. I'll talk to you next week.